at verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, Shut up, you irritate me. No. <laughs> Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. Okay, so Jesus knows that his hour of dying on the cross is quickly approaching. He knows that his hour has come. In chapter 12, verse 23, he had said, it had said, uh, Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So Jesus knows that his time to die, his, his, his time of laying his life down for us on that cross is quickly approaching. And so because he knows that his time is short, he's giving his disciples what we would call final instructions. There's only a few more days until he dies. So when you look at that, what would his final teaching be? Well, we're going to be seeing that. It's a short time until his death. What will his final teaching rest on? Well, he begins his final night of instruction with a demonstration of his deep love for them. Now, as we're looking at this, you would think that on such a night, the disciples' hearts would be right with God, but that's not so. Because their hearts are set on something else. Luke tells us in chapter 22, verse 24, that there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And so even unto that time, there's still an argument going on amongst them as to which of them should be considered to be the greatest. And when you think about it, you can understand why this kind of thing could happen amongst these men. Just look at the disciples and take a moment with me to consider some of, of what we know about them as we read our Bibles. And you'll understand why there would be a debate amongst them as to which one Jesus loved the most, which one was the greatest amongst them. There are like James and there's John, and there are, they are brothers, but they're also cousins of Jesus Christ. And so naturally it is possible for them to think as, uh, as men who are related to him through Mary, um, Jesus' mother, Surely we have a place in your kingdom. We'll see something in a moment. I'll show you about that. But surely we must have prominence. So surely we must be amongst the greatest. Obviously we must be. We're related to him. Then you have the apostle Peter. The apostle Peter was somebody who, who did something the others had no ability to do. The, the, the apostle Peter was the one who walked on water. Think about that one for just a moment if you wanted to write that on your resume as to why you're the greatest. <laughs> well, I walk on water, and the other guys were in the boat. But there I was, taking a walk with Jesus. He was there in Caesarea Philippi. And you saw pictures of Caesarea Philippi. Those of you who were with me a couple of weeks ago, I showed you it. There's, it was a resort area in northern, in northern Israel. And uh, Jesus would go there and took his, his men there, and for some R&R, &R. and while he was there, that's where he said, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And, uh, you know, thou art, uh, you, some say that you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah. Jeremiah, one of the prophets, you remember that conversation, and Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? 
uh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed art, blessed art thou, Simon, by Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say unto you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And then he points to this cave there that you see. It's still there in Caesarea Philippi. It's called the Gates of Hell. And it was a, a superstitious location that the Greeks believed um, you know, that, that sacrifices would be offered there and all. It was called the gates of hell. And Jesus points to it and says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So this is a man who walks on water. And this is the one whom the father revealed that Jesus Christ is, is the Christ, the son of the living God. Surely, surely he must have uh, prominence. When you read the, uh, the names of the apostles, the apostle Peter is always the first name mentioned. And so he had prominence. And so who is the greatest? Well, you've got James and you've got John, cousins of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got the apostle Peter, man who walks on water and makes de declarations concerning who he is. You have Nathaniel. When Jesus saw this man, Nathaniel, it's found in, in, in John's gospel in chapter 1, verse 47. He looks at him and he says, uh, this is a man who is without guile. This is a man without deceit. And surely Nathaniel could remember that. And he could say that of all the disciples, when Jesus spoke of me, he said that I was the one with no deceit in his heart. Surely I'm a man of pure heart. I must be great in the kingdom of God, the greatest. You have Andrew. Andrew is the one who brought his, his brother uh, Peter to Christ. Andrew is the one who introduced Jesus and, uh, and the Apostle Peter. So surely he could say within himself, yeah, I'm the one who brings people to Jesus. I am the greatest in the kingdom. And then there's Thomas. Now, I think that Thomas has gotten a bad reputation, to be honest with you, because when I say the Apostle Thomas, what's the first word that you associate with him? Doubting. Doubting, Thomas. I don't think that's nice. Why? Well, because in, in chapter 11 of John's gospel, when Jesus was determined to go to where Lazarus was, Lazarus who had died, and was being warned against going because of late the Jews have desired to kill you. Remember how we saw that recently as we went through chapter 11? But we need to remember what Thomas did because Thomas in, in chapter 11, verse 16 said, let us also go that we may die with him. I don't think weak people say, I will go and die with you. I just don't think that they do. Is it possible for us to be disappointed or to misunderstand and to, to act improperly based on the information we're acting on at that moment? I think Thomas did that. Jesus died and <laughs> he, he, he was in a state of, of, of pain and, and, and yes, unbelief. And that's why he said, unless I put my hand into his wound, if I put my hands into his wounds on his hands and, and, the, and the wound on his side, I will not believe, I cannot believe. Um, I don't think that's a right statement by any means, but I don't take that statement as the only thing I know about Thomas because again, Thomas was willing to go with him and die with him. Cowards don't do that. How about Philip? Philip's amongst the band that's arguing amongst themselves as to who is the greatest. But we read in, in chapter 12, verses 21 and 22, that, that he was used to bring the Gentiles to meet Jesus Christ. And then let's not forget Judas. Now, we already know enough about Judas to know that he's the betrayer. We already know that. As I mentioned, the Apostle Peter's name always lists the apostolic names. It's always the first on the list. But Judas is always the last. And it simply says, the one who betrayed him. So we know Judas. And uh, you may name, if you have a son, you may name one of them uh, Peter or Thomas or Andrew, but you never name him Judas. That's not a name you give to your son. That's a name you give to your dog. But you don't give it to your son. But do you know, remember with me, that he was so trusted that he was the treasurer. He had the common purse. He had the money. And, and Jesus was supported, you know, by, by followers. And he carried the money back. You don't give your money normally.
to somebody you don't trust. If you do, <laughs> you're going to learn not to trust them eventually. You, 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 if you give them to someone you don't trust, that's not a wise thing to do is what I'm saying. You give your money to people you trust. And, and, and Judas was trusted. And so he, I, I can picture him amongst the guys arguing who's the greatest. And Judas would be one of the fellows who was saying, I, I, am, I am the greatest. Now, all of these men had one thing in common. They wanted to be the greatest. They wanted Jesus to think they were the best. They wanted to be the most important ones in that group. They were all hungry for special recognition, and they all had to deal with selfish ambition. You see, the, the recognition, this desire for recognition, was a recurring sin in their lives. In Mark's gospel, chapter 9, verses 33 and 34, Mark records that Jesus came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? <laughs> they kept silent. For on the road, they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. In, in chapter 9 of Luke, verse 46, uh, an argument started among the, the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. In Matthew 20, verses 20 and 21, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons kneeling down, asking something from him. He said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may, may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your kingdom. This is an ongoing dispute even up to that, that, that night. Selfish ambition was present in the heart of these believers and when selfish ambition is in the heart of somebody, it's difficult to eradicate. Attention is something that everybody loves. They want it in one form or another. And, and it's easy to do something to be noticed. It's, it's easy to do something with the desire for others to see you. We, we do it because we want someone to say, that's great. That's marvelous. It's good. And, and I'll be honest with you, as a minister, as a pastor of many years, I, I can tell you that sometimes pastors succumb to the desire for, and the need for attention, to be something special, to people think, for people to think that they're a notch above the average person. It's, it's part of our heart. I mean, these men here, the apostles dealt with it. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we? Why wouldn't we? This desire for attention is, is deep within us. I was in high school, and I think I was a junior or a senior in high school, and they forced us to swim. I'm not a swimmer. I never liked to swim. They forced us to swim, and they'd make us wear Speedos. That's even worse. <laughs> there's there's got to be a law against that. But anyway, they, they, they would put us in the pool. I didn't like to swim, and my friends and I, because we didn't want to mess our hair up, we would kind of hang on the edge of the pool, you know, for 40 minutes. We would just hold on and we would talk and we'd have our elbows, you know, and we would talk. And that's what we would do in gym class. And um, one day uh, I, I was in the pool with my friends and we were just hanging around and we were the older kids. And a freshman was on the high dive and he was standing on the edge of the high dive and he began to yell to the coach. And I still remember this. I can hear his little voice, his 14-year-old voice, as he was yelling out, Coach, look at me. Look at me, coach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump. And the coach wouldn't look. So this kid kept on yelling, Coach, look at me. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump. Now, what do, what do 16, 17-year-old boys do when a 14-year-old boy is being dumb? We started yelling, look at me, coach. I'm going to jump. We were doing that in the corner. We were yelling at the coach, you know, and then the little boy jumped, you know, because the coach finally looked, and this young kid jumps into the water, and we all cheered for him, you know, and I've never forgotten that for this reason. That little guy, my heart's different now, obviously. I'm an older man, and I appreciate how people need attention, and you probably didn't get any at home and all of that. I understand that. But when you're 16 year old, years old, you don't understand that. You come to understand that later on. And that's one of those things the Lord has taught me over the years. Everybody wants attention. Everybody wants to do something spectacular. 
something that others will notice and commend them for and think they're valuable and a notch above the average person. That's part of what we do. That's part of what we are. That's how we work. And I think these men are simply dealing with a common sin and a common desire in some ways that we all have. Now, when it's an ambition for position, that's called selfish ambition. When you have the wrong heart in it, it's dangerous because when you yield to that ambition, it destroys. What happens when you're a person who's leading and you have this selfish desire to be known and to be famous, people around you become stepping stones to you achieving something that will put you into the position of higher esteem. And so what you'll do is you'll begin to use people to get to what you want. That's what people do. We see it all the time. You, you're, we used to call it a social, climbing the social ladder. You, you, you make friends with somebody because that person can help you do something. When they help you to do something and you get to be known by that person, then you move to the next person who can help you to achieve another goal. Then you move to the next person and you move to the next person until you reach the goal that you desire. And if you work at it hard enough and you begin to kind of, you know, try and get into the cool class and the cool people so you can be one of those cool ones and ultimately maybe even be noticed, when that's in ministry, it's destructive. It's destructive. I have known pastors who have never made real friends with anybody, have simply used people to get the position they wanted to do the things they wanted. They ultimately end up by themselves because they have no friends. They have no friends. You can't be using people to get what you want, but it's a very human thing. When my Josiah, who's now 16, my grandson, when, when he was around eight months to a year old, somewhere in that area, he was a little guy, he was very attached to me. And it, at my house, we have uh, uh, a couch here, and, and you can sit on it. It's one of these L-shaped, kind of like an L-shaped couch. And I, would, I always sit on this end over here, and then the couch you know, goes off to my left and goes in that direction. And my daughter would bring Josiah, and he would reach for the person sitting close to him, the first, pers the first person. He would reach to them, and that person would go, oh, Josiah wants to be with me. And Josiah would climb on their lap, and they'd be, oh, look at the baby. And then he'd move them, and he'd go to the next person, and he'd sit on their lap for a second, and they'd go, oh, and they'd tease, ha, ha, he wants to be. Then he'd go to the next person because he, he had one goal in mind. He was coming to Papa. And so he would end up on my lap. And everybody, Marie still remembers this, everybody would start busting up because he was using people to get to me. <laughs> but you want to know something, guys? That's a human thing to do, using people to get what you want. Be careful. Be careful, it destroys the body of Christ. It destroys. When you have an ambition, a selfish ambition, when you have a desire for position to be known, it's a very dangerous place to be. And Jesus has to eradicate this from his men. His men are suffering with this particular sinful malady. And that's what's happening. You see, the greatness hunger, this desire for it, it has to be overcome. And it's overcome by humility. It's overcome by love for God. It's overcome by by caring about others. And it, 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 it's also overcome when we, when we realize that, that pushing for position and attention uh, is, really, is really futile. Psalm 75, verses 6 and 7 says it like this. Exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south. But God is judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. Exaltation comes from the Lord so Jesus has to deal with their carnality, and he is, he's instructing them. In, in Luke 22, 25 through 27, he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. He who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. 
And so he's using himself as an example. Now, Jesus has been dealing with this as we've been looking through the, the scriptures. He's been dealing with this ambition in the lives of his men. And, and that has to die or the kingdom can't be established. It has to be dealt with or it destroys ministry. It can spill over into all relationships. And so Jesus is teaching them and he wants them to know something. Now, teaching usually occurs in two ways. It comes through an explanation and it comes through an example. You learn through explanation and example. It usually comes in both ways. And, and teachers are intended to give precise information to people. They need to give the fundamentals of faith. They have to be carefully ex explained. Yet, if the truth is not incarnated, Bible studies are just classroom experiences. That's why I have meetings with, with leaders every, every two weeks in, in, uh, on Sunday mornings. You guys wouldn't know this unless I've mentioned to you before. You might remember it. Every two weeks, I meet with a group of a number of men after second service. I go and I meet with them, and I mentor these men. I pour into these men. I've been doing it for years. Pouring into, pouring into, pouring into. We also have our, our Servant Saturdays where I, if you're serving, I invite you to come to be part of that. It's a two-and-a-half-hour meeting. We have a time of worship. We have, a, or so, two and a half hours or so. We have a time of worship. We have about an hour of Q&A. We have about a 35 to 40 minute um, Bible study, devotional. And I'm there to meet with you so that if you have questions and you want to know certain things, I'm there, I'm available. That's what I do. I've been doing this for years. Some people haven't taken advantage of it, but it's there for the offering so people can know. And, and I learned these things from watching Jesus spend time with his men. That's what he did. He selected the 12 that he might be with them so that he might instruct them. And he would teach them through, uh, through his normal instruction, but he would also be an example to them. He explained, but he also exampled. And this is what we're seeing here. And so Jesus is about to do something to teach them the greatness of servanthood. And he's going to visibly portray that. Now, we need to know that his act of foot washing is more than a reaction to their pettiness. It, it is a selfless, an act of selfless service. It, it's foreshadowing the cross. It, it's demonstrating the place of servanthood to these men. And so this is what's taking place. So supper was ended. Verse 2, the devil put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now, Judas was a man filled with avarice. He was greedy. He was very greedy, and the devil prompted him to act upon his greed. The greed was already there. The devil is prompting him to act on that which is already present. Remember that when Mary had anointed Jesus' feet, it was Judas who saw worship as a waste. And when Jesus openly rebuked the men and all, it convicted Judas, and the rebuke exposed the heart of this man. He determined to sell Jesus out. And that's what he did. Matthew 26, 14 and 15 says, one of the 12 called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. Judas Iscariot. Why is he called Judas Iscariot? I used to think Iscariot was his last name, but that's not what it means. Judas Iscariot is Judas Ishkariot. Ish is man, Kariot was a village. Judas, the man from the village of Cariot, is what that is. And Judas was, uh, was from a different place than the other 11. The other 11 were from the Galilee, the north. In the north, the Galilee, the Galileans, many of them, uh, many people looked at them as kind of like what Americans sometimes used to use the term country hicks. Um, they, they're people with no sophistication. And that's how the, the southern, uh, southern from Jerusalem area, that's how they looked at the northern Jews. So the 11 were looked at as being kind of like just, you know, simple-minded people. But Cariot, being down in the south, made Judas different than the other 11. So when you see Judas Iscariot, he was, one of the, he was the only one who was not part of the, the uh, people from the Galilee. There was a difference between the two. And so Judas had this, uh, this ability to be looked at, apparently, as having much to offer. 
But when Jesus, Jesus exposed the heart of these people, it went to his heart. And it says he went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. And so that's what took place. We'll look at that again in detail later. So Jesus, knowing that the father had given all things into his hands, that he, is, he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself, after that, he poured water into a basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. He came to Simon Peter. Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I'm doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands, my head. And Jesus said to him, he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. And so Jesus is well aware of the situation. He's in complete control. That's what it says there in verse 3. Jesus knows that he has absolute authority. Notice that knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. He has absolute authority. All things have been handed to him. All things are in his hands. He is in complete and absolute authority. How did he use absolute authority? He chose to demonstrate what authority is through service. What this is called is an enacted parable. He's illustrating the greatness of servanthood. So he rises from supper. Notice he lays aside his garments and he takes a towel and he girds himself. These are the men who are going to carry on his ministry after he's gone. They need to learn to serve with humility. So he models his teaching before them. They would have washed his feet. There's no doubt. But washing the other men's feet would have showed inferiority to them. And so what Jesus was doing was giving to them an example that the greatest washes the feet. We need to remember that Jesus and his men had walked from a village called Bethany. They're now in an upper room in the city of Jerusalem. Their feet would be dusty as they walked. And so at that time, the host was to make sure that his guests were made comfortable. They would come in and he would kiss them, a, kissing, a kiss of greeting. They would anoint the hair. They would wash the feet. That was all customary. And under ordinary circumstances, a servant would perform the foot washing. If there was no servant available, then the host would do that. One of them should have performed this task, but they were oblivious to it. In front of him is a pitcher. In front of him is a wash basin. In front of him is a long linen towel, yet no one moves. Someone wrote the very first thing which needs to be said about Christian ministers of all kinds is that they are under people as their servants rather than over them as their leaders, let alone their lords. Jesus made this absolutely plain. The chief characteristic of Christian leaders, he insisted, is humility, not authority, and gentleness, not power. So Jesus is there. Nothing has happened. He waits until supper is over. No one has stirred. Then he acts. He begins to wash their feet. He comes, according to verse 6, to Simon Peter, and Peter is just dumbfounded. Are you washing my feet? Remember, his concept of greatness would not allow for such a humiliating act on part of the leader. They couldn't see themselves washing each other's feet, let alone Jesus washing theirs. So service is the way that God is going to clean up the mess that humanity made for itself. Jesus is going to wash their feet. And according to Matthew 23, 11 and 12, service is the greatest, is the mark of true greatness. In, in Matthew 23, 11 and 12, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be abased. He who humbles himself will be exalted. And so he washes their feet. Notice verse 7, what I'm, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but you will later on. You will later on. You'll know later. You see, it, it humbled Peter as he saw Jesus washing feet. He couldn't allow it for himself, but Jesus has rebuked him. 
Peter was almost implying that Jesus was out of place, and Jesus made it clear, what I'm doing is right, but Peter, you're wrong. You see, even the most inspired leaders need correction on occasion. Every leader needs to remain sensitive to what the Spirit is saying in others. In the case of Peter, Jesus is about to explain what he's doing. He's saying, give me a moment, I'll explain to you what I'm doing. You don't understand right now, but you will in a moment. I'll explain to you. Remember this, if you, if you take notes, this is important. In obedience to the simple things, God will reveal the greater things. Never forget that. Excuse me. Never forget that. If you take notes, John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and manifest myself to him. Listen, guys, this is a very basic thing. I wish I could explain it in a way that would make every one of us do it. In obeying what God has taught you, in obedience to the things he has said, Jesus Christ reveals himself to you in ways that you pray for, but I have yet to experience. You come to a Bible study and you hear somebody like me say, you know what, guys? Share your faith with people. Tell someone about Jesus. And you say to yourself, I really wish I could, but that man doesn't know me, doesn't know how shy I am. I'm not able to open my mouth. I'm quiet. I'm reserved. I'm, I'm not that person. You know, other people have the gift of gab. Me, I'm, I'm a silent person. So you hear me say it. You, see, you hear me say, just open your mouth and share. And then one day, you're talking to somebody, and there's a stirring in your heart. And it may be small. It may be a flutter. You may be thinking you have indigestion, but something's stirring. And so you say, Lord, are you saying, are you, are you prompting me? I was in a Bible study the other day. Are you reminding me? I, I'm telling you, some of you know exactly what I'm saying. And you turn and you say, you know, do you mind if I share a couple things with you that I've been thinking lately? Whatever way you speak, you do that. And the person's open. And they say, really, you know, I've been thinking about these kinds of things. Thanks for talking to me about it. I've got some questions. And you start sharing, and Jesus manifests himself to you. You sense his presence. He says, if you obey me, I will manifest myself. And then you walk away from that conversation. You may not lead them to faith in Christ. Don't get caught up thinking you've got to always close the sale. Just share. Drop the seeds down. Be obedient. I am telling you, you walk away and you go, God, I can't believe it. I sensed your presence. I sensed you with me. That's what happens. So many of us short change God's work in our life by not obeying him. There are so many things you would be growing in and learning if you would simply start doing what you already know to do. It's a promise. Mark it down, John 14, 21. Mark it down. Go over it, pray about it, memorize it. But remember, God will honor his word. I am not kidding. In Psalm 25, verse 14, the Lord confides in those who fear him. He'll open himself up to you. And so he said, what I'm doing right now, you don't understand. In a moment, I'm going to explain to you, and you will. Well, as it's taking place, verse 8, Peter says, no, you're not going to wash my feet. But Jesus says, if I don't wash you, you have no part of me. If you're not washed by me, you have no fellowship with me in my ministry. In order to fellowship with me in ministry, you have to be washed. There's no other way. Well, Peter couldn't submit to the idea that the servant should be served by the master. And in this, he's missing Jesus' entire ministry. He doesn't understand that God cares for lost humanity. And Jesus is about to show the greatest act of self-sacrifice when he dies on the cross. And Peter needs to understand this in order to realize the depth of Jesus' love and his death, what it meant. 
Washing his feet is nothing in comparison to him submitting to death on the cross. And that's why he needs to understand these things. And so Simon Peter, verse 10 says, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And he who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you're clean, but not all of you. And he knew, verse 11, who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you're not all clean. He was well aware that there was one there by the name of Judas. He knew. And he said, you're not all clean. So verse 12, when he had washed their feet, taken his garment, sat down again, he said, do you know what I've done to you? Call me teacher and Lord. You say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you, ought also, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant's not greater than his master, nor is he who was sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There are two, two verses I know, two portions of scripture I know that use the word example, specifically of Jesus Christ. This is one of those places, verse 15, when he said, I have given you an example. The example Jesus is giving is an example of service. And then there's a second place that is referred to in 1 Peter 2.21, and it's another word, it's a word example that pertains to him, and that relates to his sacrifice. For in 1 Peter 2.21, 2, it says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So Jesus' example is of service and suffering, service and sacrifice. I'm showing you something. You're going to be taking this message out to the world. You cannot be fighting amongst yourselves as to who is the greatest. You can't be arguing amongst yourselves as to who I like the most. What you're supposed to do is be servants. You don't understand that. There you are seated at a meal. There's a basin. There's a towel. There's all the accoutrements for, for, for foot washing. We all have dusty feet. Not a single one of you got up and did a single thing about it. Why? Because you're arguing amongst yourselves as to who is the greatest. And I got up and I washed your feet. You tried to keep me from doing it because you know that I am your master. Why didn't you wash one another's feet? Why didn't you get up and do it? Why does somebody else have to do something for you? Isn't that something in the church that we have to deal with today? I think so. It's an attitude not only in the world, because everybody should have somebody do something for them in the world, but even in the church. I remember a lady who walked up to me. I was right here on this platform. This is before we built that sanctuary over there. She was right there, and I walked down the steps. She said, this is my first time that I've ever come here, and I just wanted to ask you a question. I said, of course. She says, what does this church have to offer me? And I said, the question isn't, what does this church have to offer you? The question is, what do you have to offer this church? I said, we teach the word of God here to equip the saints for the work of ministry. And you need to be asking a different kind of question. What can I do for Jesus? Because we have to break this attitude of what can you do for me? And Jesus was teaching that to his disciples. I've done this as an example. As I've done as service to you, do it for one another. He wasn't starting the foot washing ceremonies that some churches have you know, where everybody comes together. You know, if I announce we're going to have a foot washing ceremony, you wouldn't show up. Most of you wouldn't. <laughs> but if you did, your feet would be so pretty. <laughs> your nails would be clipped. You'd get a petty in the whole nine yards. Little smiley faces on your nails. I mean, you'd have the prettiest feet in the world. So, no, he wasn't inaugurating foot washing. What he was saying is servanthood. That's what you need to do. Now, here's something for you, too. You need to remember, he said, that the servant isn't greater than his master. But if you know these things, verse 17, blessed are you if you do them. I've had people approach me. They say, Pastor, I've got a situation. I give them a scripture, and they say to me, I already know that. And my answer is always, you might want to mark this down. In case you do that, you'll hear the same thing. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. 
It's just not a matter of you knowing these things. It's a matter of you doing these things. We can know more than we do. But the healing in your life comes through the doing, not just the knowing. You put it into practice. So Jesus says, theoretically, you've been with me three years. You know these things. But you still didn't get up and wash each other's feet. Blessed are you if you do them. And then finally, verse 18, and I'll close with verse up to 20. I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. And so he close, closes with some basic words. I'm going to give you precise information that you may not stagger, but that you might be prepared because what's about to happen can cause you great pain. It can shatter you. Therefore, I will prepare you beforehand. You will be servants, and you will bring my message of life to those who receive it. So don't be staggered about what is about to transpire because what you will see will stagger you. But if you hold fast to my promises, you will be blessed. And you will go out and you will take my word. And as they receive the things you have to say, they will be receiving me because I will be the heart of that message. As servants go out and serve, take this message and watch people's lives become transformed. The greatest in the kingdom is the servant.